and uh, which has and uh, they'd been singing the song about going to the river, river and being baptized we sang it this morning didn't we and uh, one kid said to the other one hey have you been too sure actually and the other one says but you should know you were the one that was baptized you should know and she said no i'll have to ask mum i'm not sure whether i've been baptized or not and said what about you have you been baptized and she says well no come to think of it i don't know if i have either and I uh, said, well, you're supposed to know too. And she says, yeah, but she says, I'm confused. She says, I don't quite know because some people say when you're baptised, you're supposed to go right under the water. And I never did that because I'd have been scared when I was that young. And so I thought to myself, something's getting through to these kids. And uh, you wonder if you can pick up something just to indicate that something's getting through to them. And, uh, the, and one other kid who was not in the conversation said, what do you think about it, uh, Uncle Ken? And I said, well, I'll tell you about it. So I told them about it while they were painting away. So who knows? Um, we might find that we get some real dedicated little Christians out of the effort we put into uh, <coughs> the vacation Bible school. So uh, that's sort of how we spent the best part of our week. <coughs> I'm going to talk this morning on the subject of uh, inspiration and the church. Inspiration and the church. And because you are part of the church, then inspiration must apply to you. If you're sitting here today, in one way or another, you are part of the church. Even if you've never signed up to the church, the fact that you're here today indicates that something has, has touched your mind, touched your thinking, and uh, we call it inspiration. And you say, I'm not inspired. Queen Victoria was uh, taken to visit some marvellous architecture done by one of the great architects of her day. And she looked at it silently. And uh, she walked along the pathway in front of the building and uh, she said, the man was inspired. And the person who had taken her, someone from the government or in, uh, in England, someone who had taken her said, um, Your Majesty, this architect has never stepped inside of a church. He designed a church, but had never, ever been inside of one. She said, The man is inspired. I wonder if he was or whether he wasn't. People can do great things without inspiration. But they can't do spiritual things without inspiration. Spiritual things require inspiration. The word spirit is there in that word inspiration, isn't it? You can find the word spirit. The spirit of God touches people's hearts and we call it inspiration. Because the spirit of God does something to the human mind which makes people do something, makes them want to do something that sometimes, most times, they would not normally do. Because it's not really natural for people to want to be moved towards a church or to be moved towards godly things. That is not natural. When God's Spirit has something to do with your life, you might find yourself doing things that is not natural to sinful human beings. And sometimes I think we limit the ability of God to touch people's hearts and to touch their minds and to change their thinking and to lead them where there are people who want to do what God would like them to do. So uh, let's turn to a few texts. Second Peter is the uh, first reference. Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. And here we read, We have also a very sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arise in your heart. So here Peter is saying, we have a sure word of prophecy, and if we take heed of it, 
it will be like the day dawning and then we will see that day has come into our souls. That light has come to us. Light has always been used for a, a metaphor for uh, uh, intelligence, for knowledge, for learning and understanding. That's how light is often used. When we read a text like this, we think to ourselves, well, the Apostle is talking about those major prophets of the Old Testament who were particularly moved by God and they did fantastic things like Elijah and uh, Elisha who were able to put their rod across a river and dry up the water so they could walk across instead of swimming across. Or who could raise a dead child. Or who could do combat with 400 priests of Baal who were the absolute opposition to God. And we tend to think this is what he's talking about, but he's not talking about this. He is talking about the general content of God's word. The prophets who were inspired, who were touched by the Spirit of God to do something for God. Of course, there were great prophets, and even prophets like John the Baptist did things that no normal person could do. John the Baptist was able to preach in such a way that even the most hardened people in the governments of both the Jewish economy and the Roman Empire uh, were moved. And uh, as he preached, those people were moved and they were convicted that they were sinners and they needed someone to forgive their sin, someone to deal with the sin problem for them. And uh, some of them chose to accept Jesus when Jesus came and some of them chose to ignore him. And uh, some of them, like Herod and Pilate, chose to ignore Jesus. Others, like uh, <coughs> Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, chose to follow him. But there were ordinary people too whom he was able to touch with his preaching. And so we have the sure word of inspiration. We could uh, put the word prophecy here uh, into the word inspiration. We have a more sure word of inspiration. More sure than anything else we have in our history is the word of inspiration. History has been recorded by all kinds of people. If you go back to the oldest historians, I suppose you talk with like people like Josephus and, uh, uh, and uh, men like that who recorded the uh, history of the Jews for us. Um, but uh, the history recorded in the Bible is more sure than the history recorded by Josephus. And then there was uh, fellows who wrote the books of Maccabees and the such like, which records a lot of old history of the Jewish people. Some of it uh, seems to be accurate and some of it seems to be rather questionable in places, especially when they wanted to make it look good for the Jews or, or the Maccabees, that family of people uh, in the Jewish uh, <coughs> kingdom. And uh, <coughs> however, their recording of history was the same sort of recording of history as we might do if we were to write up a family tree or we were to write up the story of uh, our family at the vacation Bible school during the week. I told the kids a serial story and uh, each day for five days I gave them a chapter of the story of my great, great grandfather. And, uh, but that's only a story according to Ken Curtis. Um, I hope it was true. I had to paint some pictures of some of the places where he was because I've never seen what Hong Kong looked like in 1842 when they had the opium wars there. And so I had to have a look in a, in a book that I've got there and try and get some sort of a picture of what Hong Kong looked like in 1842 because my great-great-grandfather fought in the Opium Wars. He was only a boy and he had to stuff the bags of gunpowder down the cannons and uh, someone would ram the thing tight and someone else would put a ball down and someone would light the uh, little uh, spot on the cannon where they, they put a charcoal, hot coal, and, of course, there was a huge boomph and the cannonball shot out. I don't think many people ever got killed by cannonballs. The risk of getting killed by a cannonball in those days was probably a lot less than winning the lottery today. But uh, they had a lot of fun with it anyway in those days. 
And uh, so I told them uh, the story. The history that I gave them of my great-grandfather was limited, very limited, because I did not have an inspiration. Not a true inspiration. God didn't tell me that this and that and the other was important or not. I just had to sort that out for myself. And so as we went through the week, I told them the story and the kids got real interested in uh, what happened um, to Edwin. And uh, <coughs> however, it wasn't inspired, even if the kids thought it was. <coughs> the history of God's people is in his inspired word, his inspired history, where writers of the scripture wrote down what God wanted to be remembered for generations to come. And uh, if we, uh, I'll, I'll just take a, a moment to look in uh, the introduction to the book, uh, The Great Controversy, Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy, and where she puts it this way. In harmony with the word of God, his spirit was to continue its work throughout the period of the gospel dispensation and during the ages while the scriptures of both the Old and the New Testaments were being given, the Holy Spirit did not cease to communicate light to individual minds as well. Apart from the revelations to be embodied in the sacred scriptures, so there was an inspiration working there, not just for those who actually wrote the Bible, but for others who were associated with these people at that time. The Holy Spirit was working there. The Bible itself relates how, through the Holy Spirit, men received warning and reproof and counsel and instruction in matters in no way relating to the giving of the Scriptures. So there were people back in those times whom God inspired, who <coughs> had their part in forming the scenario for the writers of Scripture. You see, everyone who wrote the Scripture lived in some kind of a, uh, a sphere, some kind of a scenario. Um, there is a word for it, but I won't use it because it's hard to say and you'll forget it. But uh, there is a sphere in which everyone operates. And uh, the writers of Scripture operated in that sphere. Ellen White recognised that. And she saw that there was a whole lot going on in order for the scripture to be written by men whom God particularly inspired in a particular way so that they could write down what they wanted. What were some of these things? Some of these uh, <coughs> things were the fact that historians are way back in the time of the Chronicles, when the Chronicles, before the Chronicles were written, before the books of Kings and the books of Samuel were written, historians had recorded the happenings of God's people. And they stored these recordings away. Now you say, did God inspire these people or didn't he? According to Ellen White's uh, statement, God did inspire these people to do what? To write scripture? No. He inspired them to record accurately the history of of God's people. And so when you come to the book like a book of Chronicles or the book of the Kings, for instance, you often see there how the rest of this man's history is recorded in the book of Nathan the prophet. Where's the book of Nathan the prophet? Well, we don't have it. We don't know where it is. But it was there at some stage. And so God inspired someone, Nathan the prophet, to record some of the history of these kings. And so a lot of the history is recorded. A lot of it was written on tablets and put into libraries. And so when the writers of the book of Chronicles, who, by the way, obviously wrote the book many, many years after the time of the kings, many years after the time of, uh, of uh, David and uh, the time of Saul, the time of the other kings, some hundreds of years later they actually wrote the books. That becomes obvious when you read them. But they got their information from people who God had inspired to record history. Inspiration is a big thing. It's a big thing. Sometimes we get this idea that inspiration only works in a, a, a very spectacular way. Sometimes we get the idea that God told the writers of the Bible 
to actually sit down and write word for word what he told them um, to, to write. Well, that is clearly not the case. One example would be if you were to look at the New Testament and take the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, you would see that they wrote up the story of Jesus differently. Each one is a little different. Although we call some of them the synoptic gospels because they're similar, in actual fact, when you look at them carefully, you will find they write from different perspectives. So if the Holy Spirit told them to write word for word, you must write this word and this word and this word and this word, they would all be the same, wouldn't they? And of course, this has implications when we come to translate the Bible. If God wrote the Bible down in the or had the Bible writers write down the Bible word for word in the um, uh, Greek language, uh, for instance, or in the little bit of Aramaic that's there, or the Hebrew language, if God had them write that like that, and that was the only way inspiration works, it would be a sin to translate it into another language. Why? Who knows another language other than English? Put your hand up if you can speak another language. I'm not going to ask you to speak it. Can you translate from that language into English exactly? Exactly? It's not possible, is it? It's not possible. You can get the message across all right, but can you get all the feeling across? Can you get all the emotion that a language carries across? No, you can't. Because a language has more to, uh, to do with just words, doesn't it? A language has feeling, it has emotion, it has uh, atmosphere. And so uh, if God went word for word, we call it verbal inspiration. If God used a form of verbal inspiration, God wanted specific words written here no matter what, and these agents of his wrote word for word, you would never be able to translate it because you could never get it into a language that other people could understand. And so you would have to say to everyone that you did a Bible study with, you'd have to say, now first of all, I'm going to give you a four-year course in how to speak Hebrew. And when you can speak Hebrew well enough, we'll start studying the Old Testament. And when they'd done that, you'd have to say to them, now I'm going to give you a four-year course on how to speak Koyan Greek. And when they'd learned their Koyan Greek, like I was supposed to learn some at college and I still can't uh, know what I'm, don't know what I'm talking about, after four years' course of that, then we'll sit down and we'll study about Jesus. God's not such a fool as to do that, is he? God put the Bible into words that could be translated, and uh, they can be translated because inspiration doesn't just work on those Bible writers. It works in a broader way as well. Reading from uh, uh, page 13, a great controversy. As the Spirit of God has opened to my mind the great truths of his word and the scenes of the past and the future, I have been bidden to make known to others that which has been revealed, to trace the history of the controversy in past ages, and especially so to present it to shed light on the fast approaching struggle in the future. Now Ellen White says that she was inspired to what? To take the history of past ages and make it available to people in our times. And we believe that Ellen White uh, was given a special work of, in the realm of inspiration so that uh, she could do this. And she did. But how did she do it? Well, she took some of the history that had been faithfully recorded. And so when you have people like Dobigne and some of those people of, uh, of a few hundred years ago who wrote history, um, did God inspire those people? He inspired them to to be able to record history accurately so that generations later, Ellen White and others could look at that history and say, now we see where God was taking the church, where God was taking the world, how God dealt with opposition to his church and so on. Well, <clears throat> uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's just an interesting little uh, aside, I guess. But it illustrates, I hope, something about how uh, um, inspiration works. 
there's three approaches to uh, inspiration that uh, uh, are quite important. But just let's have a look in uh, the book of John chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 5. John 5 and uh, verse 36. John 5 and verse 36. Here is Jesus speaking, and uh, he says, But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works are those that I do. A bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. How did Jesus want people to see him? Did he want people to see him just as they saw John? Just look at this text for a moment and you will see that Jesus did not want people to see him just the same way as they saw John. Why? Because John had a message to preach that was to introduce Jesus. Now if I'm going to uh, have someone come to the church to speak who's important, John Ross for instance, um, and I get up and introduce John Ross, what are you expecting? What are you expecting? Are you expecting him to say the same things that I say? Of course not. If I said, uh, if, if I'm going to say, uh, if he's going to say the same things that I say all the time, why have him? So uh, Jesus didn't expect people to see him as John the Baptist. Some people thought he was, of course. Some people thought he was John the Baptist come back and, uh, and so on. Jesus says, I have a greater witness. Greater witness than John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist inspired? No question. John the Baptist was inspired by God. God's spirit touched John the Baptist. Jesus said so. There were no greater prophet, Jesus said, than John the Baptist, except, of course, Jesus himself. And he says, I don't want people to see me. I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do. Bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Jesus is saying, I want you to see that the Holy Spirit has inspired me in a particular way that goes beyond that of John the Baptist. Would this perhaps indicate to you that uh, there is a kind of a degree system in inspiration? A degree system in inspiration. I'm not talking in degrees of quality, I'm talking in degrees of operation. You know when you come to medical things, as I understand it, and seeing as my family are all sort of medical oriented, uh, and uh, I realise uh, that, uh, and they realise that they work in the system in degrees, don't they? They work in degrees. Someone will take a medical case so far, and then they will refer on to someone else who will take it the next stage, and if you're unfortunate enough like me, you had to go through about four stages before they could find out that I had simple gallstones. But I'm glad that they worked in degrees and that I didn't stop with uh, the local GP, who actually, by the way, thought it was gallstones in the first place, but when he sent me to someone else, they thought it wasn't. And then he sent me to someone else and he thought, well, maybe, but he said, to make sure, I'll send you to someone else. And so you go through degrees. I'm glad that we work in that system of degrees in the medical system and I'm glad that God works in that kind of degree system in inspiration. Not that the quality of the work of any one medical person was at fault. The quality of their work was not at fault. But the realm of their work was different. And because the realm of their work was different, um, you could say that they worked in degrees. They worked in stages and steps. I'm sure that you understand that. And so Jesus is saying we work in degrees. In inspiration, we work in degrees. Inspiration works at different levels of understanding, at different levels of requirement for different aims and for different objectives sometimes. And so that makes inspiration a rather mysterious happening. A rather mysterious happening. How is it that sometimes God could speak so boldly, it seems, to someone like Isaiah or Jeremiah? Seemed to speak so boldly to them 
but then speak so quietly to someone like John, who wrote those three little books of John. When you look in some of those Old Testament books, you think God is speaking so boldly here to these people. His spirit seems to be so evident. And then you come to those three little books of John, and what are they? Calm, quiet, little calming books to calm down the people of the church, possibly written to an individual originally who is having problems. They're calm, quiet, assuring little books, and the Holy Spirit seems to be speaking here in a different way, doesn't he? In a calm, uh, soothing sort of a way. And you get to the book of Revelation, and the Holy Spirit seems to be speaking in mysteries. And uh, you wonder, is this the Holy Spirit? Is this God speaking in all this mysterious language in the book of Revelation? But God is using a different realm of inspiration to convey a message in a different way, a different kind of a message. Um, I think we want uh, um, verse, uh, let's go to, to uh, verse uh, um, 39. Verse 39, of, we're in John chapter 5 and verse 39. And Jesus goes on to say, we lift out a couple of voices, but uh, don't worry about that. And he says to the Jewish uh, leaders there, he says, Search the scriptures, for in, in them you think you have eternal life. Jesus is saying to them, it's the right thing to search the scriptures. But of course, he says, you are searching the scriptures because you think the scriptures in themselves have, uh, will give you eternal life. And so he says to them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Was Jesus inspired to apparently put the scriptures down and rather sarcastically say to the Jewish leaders, Carry on, search the scriptures. You think you're going to get eternal life out of them? Keep on, keep on. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? What Jesus is saying, really, the scriptures in themselves, as a book, as a piece of writing, have no power at all. The Bible has been read by people for all sorts of purposes. Did I ever tell you the story about my cousin? I went to uh, call in my cousin, I think I went to get a calf there or something, call in, and he was walking up and down on his veranda with a large book in his hand. And uh, I said to him, what are you looking at, Eric? And uh, he said, uh, I'm looking for a particular word, he said. I said, well, what's the word? He said, I can't think of it, otherwise I wouldn't have to look for it, would I? And I said, well, there's a lot of words in that dictionary. It was a thick one. I didn't know they had such a book in the house. They weren't that sort of literary sort of people, but Eric apparently liked words. So uh, he said, well, if I could find it, he says, I'd be happy. I said, well, what sort of a word is it? He said, I'm looking for a word to describe my neighbour that I can use to describe my neighbour. He just had a big row with his neighbour. And uh, I'm looking for this word, he says. I know it exists. He said, if I can find the meaning, I'll know it's the word. So he was reading through all these words, all the sarcasms and all the the most horrible words that he could use to describe his neighbour. <clears throat> we use dictionaries for better purposes usually, don't we? But all kinds of things have been uh, sought out of the Bible. And people, agnostics, have used the Bible. Um, all kinds of people who don't believe in God have used the Bible. And so the Bible, as a compilation of words is no use. This is what Jesus says. Search the scriptures, he says, for in them you think you have eternal life. The Jewish leaders searched the scriptures back and forward to find arguments where they could slaughter the Gentiles, arguments where they could enforce their laws and their rules. But Jesus said to them, they are they which testify of me. You've missed the boat, he says. Go ahead, search the scriptures, look everywhere uh, through them. You think you're going to get eternal life there? Well, go ahead and do that, he says. But really, they are they which testify of me. The scriptures, he says, talk about me. And the Jewish leaders were so disappointed. They thought Jesus was going to say, keep searching the scriptures, you're on the right track, you Jewish leaders have got it all right. Um, keep on with the scriptures. But uh, he disappointed them. They were looking for ways to trap him, and he says... Um, if you look in the scriptures in the right way, they really tell about me. They tell about me who is greater than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus was saying. Inspiration had touched Jesus in a different way than it touched John the Baptist. 
And uh, so uh, the Jews, Jewish leaders, were disappointed because John the Baptist had been an embarrassment to them. And if Jesus was going to go a stage further than John the Baptist, how much more embarrassing he would be to them. And he was. Let me take your mind for a moment or two to uh, um, a few uh, ways in which uh, inspiration seems to function. Number one. <clears throat> Number one, God reveals himself to a messenger. And that messenger will use the inspiration that God has given him to a greater or lesser degree according to what stage God wants to take that particular aspect of his message. In Isaiah chapter 6 and uh, verse 8 in particular, we see that Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord speaking to him. He also saw some phenomenal things in vision. And uh, God said to uh, Isaiah, um, um, who will go for me? And uh, Isaiah said, uh, I will go and I will be your messenger. He did not know to what extent God would use him as his messenger, but he did his work. Number two, that God impresses that messenger to share his revelation, plus supporting historical research, which makes it understandable to the people he's talking to. In other words, what God says to the messenger is put into a sphere. I'll use that terrible word I wasn't going to use. Jonya is the word. Jonya. Have you ever heard that terrible word? Jonya. We often just say it. Jonya. It's not really Jonya. Um, Jonya was, uh, was a rock star some years ago, wasn't he? Um, but that'll help you to remember it. A Jonya um, comes from the word genetics. And uh, it has a sphere in which it works. So God impresses a messenger to share the revelation that God has given him, plus he will give him supporting historical research. Um, he will use the supporting historical research so that the message is given in a genre, in a sphere that people can understand. I suppose we might use the word culture today. Number three, God guides the community to accept the messenger as and calls him a prophet. God guides the community to accept the messenger and uh, they usually call him a prophet. As you can see in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, if you want references for this. Um, the previous one, if you want a reference, Daniel 2, 17 to 24, 28 and uh, through there. Uh, number three, as we said, God guides the community to accept the messenger as a prophet uh, and to accept his message. Now, is a prophet a prophet if nobody accepts him? Is a prophet a prophet if nobody accepts him? Well, I can assure you that a prophet is always a prophet whether people accept him or whether they don't. If people didn't accept John the Baptist, it made no difference whether God inspired him or not. And if people didn't accept Jesus, it makes no difference if uh, uh, that Jesus was the greatest prophet who ever lived, ever existed. If people didn't accept him, it makes no difference to the qualities of Jesus. But I can assure you that if nobody accepted Jesus and nobody accepted John the Baptist, we would have no knowledge of either of them today. Some people accepted it, you see, and recognized it, and they wrote it down. Not all of them wrote down what they heard. Not all of the uh, disciples wrote Gospels about the life of Jesus. Most of them didn't. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were the ones who wrote. The others didn't, but they went out and they told what they'd heard. They recognized Jesus as the prophet. Number four, God guides the community. That's the community who have accepted this prophetic uh, work to keep some of the prophet's works as a permanent record of what God has said. To keep some of the prophets' works as a permanent record. Why do I say some of the prophets' works? Because we have evidence in the Old Testament in particular that some people wrote books which we don't have permanently kept. 
and the prophet Nathan is one. There were other prophets. The prophet uh, Ido was another one. They wrote books. They did their thing for a time. Those books disappeared from history. They may be found sometime, I don't know. But they were evidently not needed for long term. And so God inspires the community to take the writings of these prophets, to keep them, to copy them, record them, and keep them for long term. We call this, of course, canonization. And the Bible is the result of those people who collected together the writings of certain prophets. Not all their writings at every time, but uh, <coughs> they collect them together. Inspiration is behind all this. God has touched people and impressed them that this is what they should do. Sometimes one by one, sometimes in groups. Number five, God guides the community, that's you and I, to read and apply his word to their lives. That too is inspiration. And that's where I started this morning. What made you come to this church today? Did you ever think that maybe God did something in your mind which caused you to be here today? That's interesting, isn't it? An interesting thought. If God touched your mind today and he took you here today and he decided to be here today, you must be a very important person in God's sight. Isn't that right? Would God take you someplace where it was no good for you? Of course he wouldn't. If God wasn't interested in you, would he take you somewhere where you'd hear about God? Of course he wouldn't. You must be an important person. God touched your mind today, whether you know it or whether you don't. Perhaps you crawled out of bed this morning and you said, I don't feel like going to church today. I've had a hard week. Perhaps you had sore feet, sore head, sore stomach. Perhaps you just got over the flu. Perhaps you've still got it. But God touched your heart. That's why you're here today. God inspires the community to read his word and to apply it to their lives. Romans 14, uh, 15 verse 4, John 16 uh, verse 13, another good reference. Ephesians 1 uh, um, 17, 19, 20 and up around those areas. Good references. God touches the community. Inspiration works through there. Number six, final one. God impresses the community, that's us, to extend the benefits of knowing the word to others who are ignorant of it. God impresses the community to extend the benefits of knowing the word to others who are ignorant of it. Do you know that inspiration doesn't stop with God bringing you to a knowledge of the word? Inspiration works also on you as an individual and you feel impressed that you must tell somebody else. You must do something to help other people who are in darkness and in ignorance to come to know something of this God who works all the way through these different avenues so that he might be loved and appreciated and so that people might want to be where he is. Romans 10, verses 14 to 17. So how does inspiration work? You're just as mystified now as before we started the sermon, aren't you? It's impossible to describe it entirely. If we, could, uh, if we could understand inspiration in its entirety, we would be God himself. But God is good enough. Good enough to show us that he comes and touches our hearts. I use the word hearts because it's a little bit more emotional than mind. When we talk about mind, we're talking really about academics and that sort of stuff. But it's more than that. God touches our hearts. And God works through all kinds of avenues so that your heart and my heart can be touched so that we will want to respond to the love that he shows to us. So that we can understand something of what it cost to bring this fallen sinful world back into harmony with the rest of God's universe. I've often looked at what, uh, just for fun really, for what uh, these clairvoyant kind of people, these people who write up the horoscopes in papers and women's magazines always have a double spread page of them, don't they? 
don't think I read women's magazines, but sometimes there's nothing else to read when you're in the dentist's or at the doctor's. And uh, the horoscope page is always open. And there's always something in there that tries to impress you that you are out of harmony with the universe. But if you do this and if you do that or something else, you'll be in harmony with the universe and everything will go right with you. Well, don't believe all that nonsense, of course, because horoscopes are made up by someone who's having a laugh. Biggest laugh of their week to write up the horoscopes. They don't believe a word of it. <clears throat> but we are out of harmony with the universe. This whole world is out of harmony with God's universe. It's the only world that's gone against its creator. But God has set in motion something that only he can set in motion, that only he can give, and that is the work of inspiration. And it works all the way down through these steps and stages so that you and I can be brought back into harmony with the rest of the universe. I'm glad that God has done this. I don't claim to understand it all. But I know that there are stages in which it works. And this inspiration works on each individual a little differently than it does another. Why? Because you're wired a little differently than everybody else. And God has an individually designed inspiration for you. Does that mean you're going to jump up and be a prophet to the church or whatever? It doesn't at all. It means that God is touching your heart so that you can come to know him and so that you can be brought into harmony with his universe so that you can praise him with all those other beings on unfallen worlds, the hundreds and thousands and millions of them. Worlds, I mean, not people. If we're talking of people, we're talking about billions and trillions and where do you go from there? I don't know where you go above that. Inspiration is a marvellous thing. Thank God today that he's prepared to do whatever is necessary to touch your heart and my heart so that we can appreciate what he has done to save us to fit back into his universe again. I'm glad that God is in his church, that God is in his leaders, that God is in the individual church members, bringing them slowly, surely, steadily, and certainly back into harmony with him so that we can enjoy eternity back in harmony with his universe. We have a hymn, it's 537, if you want to... Use a hymn book, 537, He Leadeth Me. And uh, so let's uh, sing to close.